Next on the show, we have Jeff Glickman. He is the chairman for J4 Capital LLC. Jeff, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm very fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being on the show. Jeff, uh, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Oh, sure. Happy to do that. Uh, I have a background in artificial intelligence that goes back to the uh, 1970s, and we've been working to solve a really an unsolved problem in artificial intelligence, which is how do you build computers that are smarter than people? And um, so we've been working on that since the uh, early 2000s, and we've succeeded in building what is the world's first artificial superintelligence. So would that be across the board um, intelligence? I mean, is it uh, articulating um, just as humans would do? Well, we haven't built those modules yet. So okay. uh, internally, the machine is uh, thinking, and it's thinking though using a special form of mathematics. And we're able to read and understand that and converse with the machine through that. But we've not uh, added articulation modules at this point. Okay. Well, in that same vein, then, uh, what is our artificial superintelligence? Well, sure. Uh, It's essentially the ability to solve problems that are beyond the grasp of human comprehension. Um, So one of the the things that motivated us to do this was to try and solve the problem of understanding the way that the equity markets function. And uh, so we built the machine originally with that intention, though we wrote the software to be general purpose so that it could be used to solve or address things in any field. And uh, anyway, to this extent, uh, we have been able to solve the problem of how the equity markets function. We have a a map, if you will, which changes over time, um, and the machine is able to use that to estimate where the market is going. Okay, and how is uh, ASI, for for lack of a better term, or artificial superintelligence, how is that different than artificial intelligence? Well, uh, so AI today is really, uh, there's several different variations of it. The, there's the sort of the older school from the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then we had this thing called the AI winter where almost nothing got done. And then with the advent of more powerful computers beginning in the really the late 80s, early 90s, we started to see an emergence of uh, the, the field we call machine intelligence today. Um, and those uh, systems, and, and I hold the foundational patents for, for machine intelligence today, those systems have limitations, and that is they're able to come up to the ability of human uh, intelligence, human capability, but not really exceed it and not really deal with things that are much more complicated. So take, for example, the problem of driving a car. Um, not very difficult for you or I, uh, but as it turns out, really, really hard for a computer to do. And as much as uh, several of the pioneering companies today are trying to solve this problem, there's been challenges with dealing with different kinds of weather and uh, uh, different kinds of environments. And if you're on dry pavement on an interstate, all is fine. Uh, but if you're on wet pavement, pavement with you know reflections and all this kind of thing, uh, things get difficult. Uh, so ASI, on the other hand, uh, solves problems in a completely different framework. And it's able to begin with solving problems that are uh, more complicated than humans can can deal with, but then go into much, much uh, more complex issues. So what are the applications then? Well, uh, we started in the financial markets, uh, and that was intentional. We, we really felt that we saw... Uh, some things is around uh, in the 2000-2004 time frame that we really want to try and tackle and, and solve, which was, is it possible to understand how the, um, the equity markets are structured, and can you use that structure to predict in the short-term future um, how those markets are going to behave, in, let's say, 24 hours from now or, or potentially even on shorter time horizons? Um, but the applications, as it turns out, are unlimited. Uh, so just as a human has a certain level of intelligence, which can be applied to 
uh, anything that we do on a day-to-day basis, such as the case with ASI, but again, able to tackle vastly more complex computational problems or, or problems that are more complicated than a human can solve. Um, so can ASI, ASI, I'm sorry, can ASI be used for anything else? Well, sure. Uh, absolutely. I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, one of the difficult problems in medicine today is called the phenotype-genotype problem. So, for instance, uh, the genotype is the way our genes are set up, organized, and expressed within uh, DNA and within the body. Uh, the phenotype problem is how do those genes express themselves into disease? And so can you take disease and disease progression and can you map that back into somebody's genes? Um, and either on a you know personalized basis for personalized medicine or more generically on large, large populations so you can understand um, this mapping. That's a really, really difficult problem a part of which is that we don't really fully understand what are genes yet in medicine and um, how do they express themselves. So tackling large-scale problems like that is one uh, good example. But I'll give you another one. Another one is you know robotics. Um, let's say you're in Amazon and um, you would like to automate more of your warehouse function. Well, we have the hardware. We have you know, the physical robots, but they're not smart enough to be able to operate autonomously. And so one of the things ASI can do for robotics is that allows the machines to uh, essentially problem solve as they're going rather than having to have a pre-programmed plan of how they're going to solve the problem. So those are two examples. Okay. And what are, if any, what are the risks with, with ASI? Well, that's a that's an interesting issue. Um, we've run into some really uh, pretty serious problems here. When we uh, brought the machine up, um, which was in June first of two thousand fifteen, uh, what we found was we built this sort of isolated thinking module, problem solving module, um, but we found that we hadn't included anything about feelings or environment. And it, it turns out that emotions are just as critical in the process of processing information as thoughts are, as thinking is. And emotions become regulatory. That is to say, they help assist with knowing where you can think or should think and where you shouldn't think. Um, so if you do not have this emotional framework in place in, in a supercomputer and in an artificial superintelligence, what happens is that the, the machine becomes dysfunctional. It tries to solve the problem, whatever problem it's been given to solve, at any cost. And our morality, our um, you know, Judeo-Christian heritage basically says that uh, there are things which we can do and can't do and things we should do and shouldn't do with regard to morals, ethics, um, and values. And uh, so without that emotional module, we ran into a machine that essentially um, exhibited certain sociopathic behaviors. It would go ahead and do things even though it, it might go into areas where you might prefer that it didn't. Uh, so the yeah, inclusion of emotion regulatory modules is, is essential machines for safety. Jeff, thank you so much. It's fascinating stuff, and I can't wait till we have you on again so we can talk about this some more, but I am running out of time. Thank you for being on the show. A real pleasure. Take care. On the show, we have Valto Loikinen. He's the CEO of Grow VC Group. Valto, welcome to the show. Welcome back to CEO Money. I'm your guest host, Grayson Ormistead. I want to apologize to Jeff. I was, I'm a little out of sorts. I was in a car accident yesterday, and the relief medication is in full effect. So, Jeff, oh my. welcome back to the show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Jeff, um, let's continue where we left off. Um, and you were 
talking to me about the risk with a- ASI and some of the problems that you were running into. Uh, it, it sounds like you're when it, well in, in my experience when you run into problems like that you're close to a breakthrough would that be a fair assessment yes uh, that's a fair assessment so um, you know we've, there's been a lot of conversation um, in the industry and among futurists about what the potential risks are with uh, artificial intelligence and artificial superintelligence I think we're just about the only folks who've lived through it and seen it happen and uh, so we can confirm that uh, the fears are, are real <laughs> and you know I, I, every listener or at least myself is playing through the scenario of uh, computers taking over the world and the human race uh, when we're talking about this type of uh, technology <laughs> of course that's science fiction isn't that correct Jeff uh, well, that's all I hope so. <laughs> uh, Give me some no, reassurance we're, here. We're, 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 you know, we're being really careful. So we have a containment system. Um, uh, analogically, is is a bit like uh, the one that the CDC uses uh, for containment of infectious diseases. Uh, so we have both uh, electronic and physical containment, and um, we're experimenting to understand what are the regulatory mechanisms are, that are necessary in order to keep the machines safe and to keep us safe, and, and we're having good success there. Well, good, good. Um, so as the technology um, develops, is that going to increase the uh, where the applications might go in the future? Well, I think so. Um, I, I think, you know, the if you think about it, uh, what can humans do, if you start with that question, and then you realize that machines um, can be much more complex and much more capable than humans, then what you're really saying is any field in which humans uh, do things, really at any level, regardless of the complexity of the thinking, uh, is where machines can go as well. Um, So uh, pretty much anything you can think of. Um, So... it doesn't have to be a repetitive uh, job description for a machine to to t- go in and take that spot. Is that correct? Yeah, you're exactly right. So when computers first came online in the 19, you know, 30s, 40s, really 40s was at the the core of it. Uh, these were calculating machines. They really were just calculators that could just go faster, um, and uh, with our machines over the years, they've just become bigger, faster calculating machines, but they had fixed programming. The unique thing about what we're doing is that there is no fixed program. We've written code which allows the computer to write its own code. And so the machine evolves and changes as it needs to solve problems and adapts to its environment. So it's very different. Uh, It's not calculating, it's not repetitive. It's just problem solving whatever is in front of it. So that suggests to me that this this technology will be very interactive with humans as well. We expect that in the future. Yes, uh, today we don't have any uh, voice input or voice output. Uh, everything's done through essentially foreign mathematics, but uh, we will add the, the necessary modules for uh, better human interaction. So right now, um, I'm I'm looking at uh, your bio here. Um, so these applications that are in effect right now are software, hardware, communication, image processing, video processing, pattern recognition. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, that, that's uh, that's sort of a, a list of my background. Um, in, you know, inside the machine, it's a it's a new kind of programming, a new programming paradigm, uh, which is able to uh, to solve any kind of problem you throw at it. So uh, what we used to call things like pattern recognition was where somebody would write a program to look for patterns. Well, we don't do that anymore because the computer writes its own code to solve the problem. Okay. But you, you're, the, all those applications are available and in place right now. Well, those are, those are fields, disciplines I've worked in in the past. And I'm sure you've integrated that into your your business model, correct? It has the machine has those capabilities. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm getting at. I yeah. apologize. 
Jeff, um, anything else you want to tell to our listeners? Well, um, you know, the, the one comment I'd add on risks uh, is uh, a topic uh, called universal basic income. It's uh, the notion that uh, we should give people what they need in order to, um, you know, be able to feed themselves, clothe themselves, have shelter, that kind of stuff, and then let them go on to do whatever else they want in life. Um, one of the issues with these machines is the erosion that they're going to put into the workforce. So if you look at University of Oxford study, they're anticipating by 2033, about half of the jobs will go away uh, due to artificial intelligence and artificial superintelligence. So if that happens and we have a, uh, a taxing system and economy that's based on consumer side taxing, um, then we're going to have, you know, 50% or less of the tax revenue that we used to have. Uh, so the flip side is, is looking to the future, uh, talking about things like producer side taxation, and then um, taking those funds and giving people universal basic income, which has had some really wonderful experiments, and some, some of them have worked and some of them haven't worked. Um, but then people could then decide – knowing that they're safe and secure, uh, what other contributions they're going to make to society, whether they're going to be an entrepreneur or they're going to build another business or um, they're going to do something in an artistic endeavor. Uh, but these are, these are serious conversations we're probably all going to need to have pretty quickly uh, as these machines um, uh, sort of take aim at eroding um, jobs in our workforce. Well, you know what, Jeff, the whole time we've been talking um – that has been coming back to, or coming to my mind, and I didn't want to bring it up um, to paint your your technology in a bad light. But that's what's probably going through everybody's mind is um, sure. computers, machines replacing human jobs. So I'm glad you addressed it. it it's a it's a real issue, and uh, there have been, as I said, some really interesting experiments in UBI. Some have worked, some haven't. But in India today. Um, they're beginning an experiment where they're going to put 300 million people, that's about, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 percent of the population in India, on universal basic income. So roughly the population of the United States is going to be on universal basic income in India, and they're going to try it as an experiment and see how it goes. Very good. It's terribly interesting material. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show. I apologize about the glicks with us today um i'll I'll be better next week (laughs) okay all right jeff thank you for being on thanks for having me on take care bye-bye you've been listening to ceo money this segment was brought to you by page trader if you want to know what's happening in the markets tomorrow visit pagetrader.com